best time in at least 15 years, and honestly, probably longer than that, to be starting a career in technology. focus on a culture that is good at repeating innovation and I think this is one of the harder things to build in any kind of institution
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure to see this Audi Max filled with so many motivated students, professionals from SAP, as well as representatives of this university and other very welcome guests. My name is Alexander Dahmen, and I have the honor to welcome you tonight on behalf of the TUM Speaker Series. SAP provides enterprise software and services to manage business operations and customer relations worldwide. Today, we will learn more about their new AI co-pilot, Jewel, directly from Christian Klein, their CEO. With Jewel, SAP is aiming to transform and potentially redefine the way companies work all over the globe once again. We will begin the event with opening words by Professor Dr. Kramer. He is the Senior Vice President for Research and Innovation here at TUM. He will then invite Christian Klein onto the stage. After his keynote, we will have a moderated discussion and also answer your questions from the audience. The evening will then end with a reception in the Immertale for everyone who has a ticket. So it, without further ado, please welcome Professor Dr. Kramer onto the stage. Well, it's really fantastic to see a completely full room. So welcome, everyone. Dear students, dear guests, welcome to the TUM Speaker Series, an event that invites thought leaders, visionaries, and experts from different fields to share their insights and to inspire us. You will have the opportunity later to ask questions, and you are encouraged to do so, so you can think about it during the talk. As always, the speaker series aims to foster dialogue and motivate innovation. Today, we are honored to have Christian Klein, the Chief Executive Officer of SAP, here with us. His journey with SAP began in 1999 when he joined as a student. Over the years, he has taken on various roles within the company. In 2016, he assumed the position of Chief Operating Officer. In 2019, he was appointed co-CEO, and in 2020, he became the sole CEO. In this role, Christian Klein is responsible for SAP's corporate strategy management and ultimately the performance of the world, one of the world's foremost software companies. According to Wikipedia, Mr. Klein is a soccer fan and an avid supporter of some of FC Bayern Munich's fiercest competitors. The topic of his talk is artificial intelligence for good. AI can have a positive impact across so many areas. In healthcare, AI can enhance diagnostics and enable personalized treatment, contributing to early disease detection. In education, AI can enable customized learning experiences, fostering inclusivity. AI can benefit environmental conservation through data analysis for sustainable practices. In disaster response, AI can predict scenarios and coordinate relief efforts. On the other hand, proper training and responsible implementation are critical to ensure successful AI use and to minimize risks. Responsible artificial intelligence can be a force for positive societal transformation for many years to come. As usual, before I hand over to tonight's speaker, I would especially like to thank the organizer team. The students behind the TUM speaker series are volunteers who show us that hard work and meticulous planning can result in remarkable events. Your dedication, thank you, yeah, thank you. Your dedication exemplifies the spirit of TUM, and we are immensely proud of what you have done. I believe it's the first step in also becoming a CEO one day. Thank you for joining us tonight. 
I wish you an enjoyable evening. I'd like to ask Christian Klein to come to the stage. Yeah, so thanks a lot, Professor Kwama. It's a pleasure to be here. Great stage, I have to say, and it's great to also feel this time that I'm you know, almost uh, the oldest uh, in, the, in the room. And you know, to give you a big background of myself, some of you probably don't know, I actually also spent some time during my study in Munich in Hasenberg. So, you know, I know the real estate market is pretty hard, and during my study, I made it to Hart and Bagel, and that was the time, probably you don't know it, I'm not sure if the Milch Bar still exists, but at that point, it was actually in the Kunstpark Ost, and I can remember the Monday evenings in the Milch Bar, yeah, so, yeah, but it's 22 years ago, time flies. And, um, you know, I just saw uh, when the team gave me an intro that also, uh, Sam Altman was here, and I don't take it necessarily as a bad sign given the recent developments over the weekend. But OpenAI oh, is a great partner, and we will come to that. And um, the title of uh, my opening speech tonight is How Can We Use AI for Good? And especially when you look at SAP, when you're running the world's most mission critical business models business processes, it's of course for us very important to not only use AI yeah, to make companies more productive, to help them to grow, but also to make this world a bit better every day and to turn these companies also into sustainable enterprises. And just to give you a little bit context about how you know, SAP will play in AI compared to the AI we all know in the B2C world. I actually asked ChatGPT, how can you use SAP AI for good? And actually I have to say, eh, it was pretty good answers. Yeah? Sustainability is, as I said, a big topic in our product strategy. We're actually going to deliver a green ledger to actually enable our customers to track and trace carbon footprint. And as we are also running many supply chains, and of course, we also want to measure scope two and scope three. And of course, generative AI will play a big role in that to make this even smarter and to increase the transparency of carbon footprint, but also to ensure that the supply chains are more sustainable and also, of course, um, adhering to the latest human rights. So that is good. But then I asked the question, Give me more actions. How can actually SAP decarbonize the uh, supply chain? It's actually a very relevant topic. Not only for SAP, we discussed that just lately in the executive board, but when you're sitting together with the Samsungs, with the Nikes, with the Adidas, or any other company, this is a big challenge what customers are facing. And while the answers are all not bad, not wrong, what I'm missing is a concrete action plan. Concrete actions, a concrete project plan. What can we do? And what I'm missing is actually business data. Concrete insights about where do I stand today as a company and how can I decarbonize uh, to actually be more sustainable in the future. And this is exactly the place where SAP will play. Because now that we are actually moving away from traditional AI into generative AI, this is actually the size of the supercomputer we are building with NVIDIA and Google right now to push all of the SAP data. We have 400,000 customers, 40,000 gave us the consent to use the data in an anonymized way, and Google will enhance that. So with BigQuery, we are actually also giving our customers access to non-SAP data. And this is what we are now building in one foundational data model. And now suddenly, you know, you cannot only build a machine learning use case for one scenario, you can answer a lot of questions which go cross company to really solve some of the most burning challenges of our customers. And for us, it's very important to, of course, not only 
talk and follow a hype, but to be relevant. And I come later to what our co-pilot, we call our co-pilot Jule, and our co-pilot not only has a wi uh, nice name, we also want to be, of course, want to make sure that our co-pilot is also incredibly smart and intelligent. But also, Jule needs to be responsible and reliable. Think about that. When you ask ChatGPT today a question, of course, we are screening the World Wide Web. And I can assure you there will be a lot of copyright questions still coming up about what content is getting reproduced and is getting used in another context. We as SAP, we, we cannot afford that. We need to make sure that every customer is providing us a consent, that we also use the data in a responsible way. And of course, we need to be reliable. Not everyone can see the group PNL of SAP inside SAP. Shouldn't. So you need to also have a clear authorization and identity concept. And of course, as we as I said, we are now using you know s um, ca the customer data for finance, for supply chain, for HR. We are using Queen Ledger data, ESG data, and pushing this in one module. With Microsoft, with Google, with AWS, we are actually extending our data model to also give our customers semantical access to non-SAP data. NVIDIA, AMD, our hardware partners. And SAP will, will not play in co developing actually the next large language model, but what we want to make use is we want to build this control plane, this foundational data model, because we feel we have data which no one other, other company has for the B2B world. And so, while some co-pilots only speak CRM, or only you know, talk HR, you know, our co-pilot will talk all kinds of languages, languages in the terms of business functions, so that we can cross-correlate data. And here are some of the examples where we are what, what we are already you know, working on with our data scientists. So, for example, when it comes to the business models and intelligent business processes of our customer, how can Joule help me to reduce my downtime in the factories? Think about that. When you take, for example, Nike, they have one, around about 600 KPIs who predict that demand. Weather data, internal data, consumption data, economic data. And we can not now not only do the supply check about that those shoes are at the right time, at the right location you know, for the consumer demands, now we can actually also do an end-to-end -end planning with generative AI, so to also uh, adjust the factory planning, the resource planning, the workforce planning. Planning is a complex thing inside a company. And a lot of people are really tasked by that. And still, oftentimes, it takes up to five months to get a demand shock actually adopted inside a company and across the supply chain. In the future, tool and generative AI can solve for that. Or take, for example, resilient supply chains. You know, how about my medical supply? With Roche or Novartis, we're actually innovating on supply chain traceability. And how can we make sure to optimize also the logistic chain? When there is a, a disruption in the supply chain, like, you know, you might remember, you know, the disruption in the Suez Canal. You know, what can we do to actually then still make sure that the, the delivery is happening on time? That there is no disruption in the production you know, of the medical supply. In COVID, it's what actually extremely important for Pfizer and others that we actually could show them still a way to bring the ingredients for the vaccine from Asia all the way to the US or to Europe. And there are a ton of people, a ton of data today involved to actually solve this problem. And in the future, we can solve this problem with generative AI. And sustainability, I already mentioned that. Nestle, Unilever, the amount of food waste is extremely high in their supply chains. So also there, how can we actually optimize supply chain logistics to reduce food waste? or with Aldi, or Schwarz, or, or Costco, we're actually also saying, how can we adjust dynamically the pricing when you go shopping you know, in one of their stores? How can we actually adjust pricing that they actually reduce the waste for vegetables? 
because they have too much of one sort of vegetables. And so how can we influence the demand? And this is SAP. This is where we have the data. And in the future, our data scientists build one machine learning model for supply chain optimization, or we build one model for, su for sustainability, or for financial predictions. And now we are going cross. And this is because of the increase of the computing power, which we have in one of those large, large data centers around the world. And you know, one final piece before we come to Q&A, you know, that's also what I got as a recommendation, yeah, that I should ensure that, you know, because you are the future of AI and technology, that hopefully I gave you a good impression around, you know, what this technology can do. And again, for us, it's very, very important that we also apply AI with the right standards. Because there are multiple scenarios in multiple industries where you can also apply not in an ethical way, not according to our values. And this is why we also have an external board who is always checking our algorithms for non-bias if you use our recruiting function. It's not good to only hire Christian clients. So you need to have a diverse workforce. And we have people checking for that. Or we actually also want to make sure that in the defense industry, we're also going to apply AI in the right way and not in a bad way. And this is very, very important. And for us, as the climate crisis, and you know, my, yes, I played a lot of soccer when I was a kid. Now I'm more in the mountains here in Austria, Switzerland, and I love to hike and love to ski. And when you see how our, you know, the, how the climate change is actually impacting already our environment, of course, it's our joint obliga uh, obligation to use this technology really for good to fight the climate change. And this is actually something where we are innovating a lot. And I hope I, can, I could give you some insights around what our plans are. I can tell you with this data what we have, with the insights what we have, we can really change complete industries once again. Last time I saw something like that with the, with the rise of the internet. And now with generative AI, I'm sure whole industries, whole business models will change once again. So many thanks for having me this evening, and now I'm looking forward to Q&A. Thank you. Thank you for your inspiring presentation. It really is a pleasure to have you here, here with us, Chris. I will quickly recap the structure of this moderation. First, I will ask you some detailed questions, followed by 15 to 20 minutes of audience Q&A, where you will have the opportunity to ask your questions. Um, after that, we will do some rapid-fire questions, uh, and then we will close with the last, more open question. Shall we begin? Yeah. Let's start at the very beginning the year 1999, which, by the way, is the year I was born. Um, <laughs> it's the year you started working at SAP. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure if I should take this as a compliment. <laughs> what were your own expectations for your career back then? Oh, well, 1999. Um, uh, you know, in SAP, it's actually, it takes you one year to understand, you know, all, all we have a very own language, and we have acronyms for everything. And I really ask myself, you know, is you know, after one year, will I ever understand, you know, how we are running these very complex business processes? And then you need to draw the connection to the technology and to the data. Yeah, but uh, back then, of course, you know, I was eager to learn. And then at a certain point, I was really, you know, caught my, you know, my my commitment and my passion because I could really see what kind of impact we are having on 400,000 customers around the world. And yeah, and then step by step, you know, I built my career, but for sure I would not have foreseen that I'm sitting here tonight on this stage and being the CEO of SAP. I didn't plan for that. You just mentioned that um, you discovered how you can have an impact on so many people. Is that this sort of personal or emotional connection that kept you at SAP? 
yeah, I was, um, as Gerd knows that, I was actually once very close to leave SAP 15 years ago. Microsoft was not in the city center. They were out there in the airport somewhere. And I changed my mind very last minute. Probably was not such a bad uh, decision. Also shows you that sometimes you have some patience yeah? because as a young person, sometimes you, of course, you, you, you are eager, you, you want to move, yeah? you want to actually make the next step. And, but uh, for me at the end, you know, it was always important, first of all, to have good mentors, yeah? mentors who actually, you know, also give you honest and open feedback, who give you a stage yeah? so that they also empower you to show what you can do, that you can run a project with a customer or that you can run a strategic project inside SAP. And, uh, and then second, of course, what was always very important that I had a, some kind of a learning curve. So I really saw the company, you know, from all angles. And today, actually, I feel I benefit a lot because a move to the cloud, you know, what we are doing and fundamentally changing our business model is more than technology. It has to do with culture. It has to, to do with the operating model of SAP. You have to do change management. You have to look at the bonus plans. Obviously, the strategy is super important, which everything needs to be connected to. So today, I actually benefit a lot that I know really the company you know, inside out. Let's talk more about Juul and SAP's position as an established software giant. How did your company structure benefit or hinder the development of Juul? Yeah, look, um, you know, as I, I really have the insights into, you know, three, three worlds, one in the United States, here in Europe, and then in Asia. It's actually pretty interesting. When you sit in the business roundtable, this is a collection of 40 U.S. CEOs. There I'm one of many tech CEOs. Um, you know, actually, they talk about the opportunities of AI and how AI can help to transform the United States to do the, you know, energy uh, transformation or how to actually help, how AI can help the automotive companies, etc. So they see the opportunities and even the, the, the government, yeah, when you talk to Janet Yellen, uh, Secretary of Finance, she wants to understand, you know, what AI can do. When they were then sitting in the European round table and talking, yeah, to our European politicians, to the commissioner. We talk a lot about risk and a lot about regulation. And uh, uh, sometimes I say, let's get started and then we can still regulate. What do you want to regulate before we actually have something in practical use? And there you see actually also the cultural differences. And so for us as SAP, of course, it's, it's important that we can apply AI across our customer base. We have a lot of multinational customers. And I always tell, and I learned that very early, don't fall only in love with your own technology. Always think about what does it do for the customer. And as we are running the business model of many customers, as we are running their business processes, we, of course, have to apply AI in a way so that it sits actually embedded in, in their business. So what does it do for the supply chain? What does it do for the end-to-end -end planning? What does it do so now that I can sleep better when it comes to my quarter end? What can it do to really better predict the quarter? And then, of course, also take some necessary action. And this is actually what SAP does, and this is now how we also came up with Joule, you know, so to always also show the technology in the business context. Okay, so could you just maybe elaborate what exactly what role does Joule play in your strategy for SAP? Yeah, I mean, I, I can give you some insights into SAP. I mean, um, we are investing a ton of money not only in our own AI tools, but also into GitHub or some other, you know, AI tools uh, to make, you know, our own workforce more productive. Uh, actually, when you look into uh, our developers who are actually now producing code in a highly automated way, they are now 50% more productive. Now you can deduct 10% for the quality checks because it's not perfect everywhere. But this is, of course, massive. Yeah? When you look into customer support or pricing, when I now go to a customer, actually, we have a tool already inside our CM who actually tells me, you know, do this pitch. You know, this customer has a big focus on sustainability. So talk about the green ledger, talk about decarbonization. 
There is not anymore, you know, my customer office who has to produce the whole content. And the same we, of course, apply then also outside to our customer. Uh, yesterday, uh, we talked to um, Telefonica, you know, around how to make the assets, the infrastructure grids more efficient. And so we actually talk about how we can connect their 5G with our ERP and not only do IoT, but how can generative AI also help in predictive maintenance, that you have the right field workers at the right time before something breaks. And, you know, this is how we actually apply that technology inside and outside the company, and it will change a lot. We do a lot of reskilling. We are bringing in a lot of people. So I also have to do a commercial here, yeah? So you can work in Munich, you can work in Gashing, we are now in Gashing, we, you can work in Palo Alto, we have um, a lab in India and in other places where actually, of course, everywhere now AI is embedded. Yeah? If you code on our finance, on our supply chain, when you code on the technology, on the platform, everywhere AI is embedded. And all product owners, before we start a meeting, need to tell us first, how will AI change the business of your customers? And then we get started. We all know that, as you said, um, Europe is pretty good at regulating new technologies. But is AI maybe the opportunity that Europe has been waiting for to catch up with America's and Asia's software landscape? Yeah, I mean, we have a lot of industrial data. But I can tell you, you know, here with Oliver Zipse, you know, actually BMW, they came once to me, he's coming close to Heid from Heidelberg and he once visited me, I will never forget that. And he said, Christian, with my electric cars, I actually have not so much a clue of how sustainable they are versus a traditional BMW because I cannot track and trace carbon footprint, especially not when it comes to scope two and scope three. So we invited Siemens, Bosch and many others suppliers of BMW to join Catena X, a network where you have to share data. I can tell you, Alexander, to actually make everyone, give everyone to trust that sharing data is not a bad thing <laughs> and no one steals your patents or your production data was such a hard thing. Yeah, Private-wise, we share everything sometimes. You know, you go and Amazon can follow you, everyone can follow you, but in business, especially here in Europe, there is still this mistrust. Now we actually made great progress, and the, but the same is true for AI. When we don't share data, when we don't use anonymized data, we will not get better in research for cancer. We actually have a big treasure here in Europe compared to the United States when it comes to healthcare. We are, you know, there are a lot of public institutions, there are more standards. So we can use AI, data and AI to get way better in research, not only for cancer, but if you don't share the data, then it's getting a problem. Yeah? And so this is something where Europe has to really wake up. And it's also the same for a sovereign cloud. We are building now for multi-billion dollars with Microsoft the Delos cloud, the German sovereign cloud. In Paris, we are doing the same for President Macron and his government. It doesn't make sense. Because actually, you know, when we would really build one sovereign cloud for Europe, you know, you can scale much better. And while SAP and Microsoft maybe can overcome this complexity, for a startup like Alep Alpha, it's a big problem. Because you have to, you face in every country, not even here, it's even worse, you face in every state, you face another data protection officer who has in Bavaria a different understanding of the Datenschutzgrundverordnung than in Baden-Württemberg. And this is, drives me sometimes crazy when I hear Mr. Söder doesn't want to, you know, always play ball when it comes to the Steuer, uh, the Steuererklärung. I would like to digitize that, but there are a few states who want to do their own thing, and it's not good. And so this is something where Europe really has to wake up because, yes, we have a lot of assets, especially with, around our industries, but we have to use this data, we have to share, and we need to come together beyond existing competitors like Oracle, some startups have successfully reinvented individual components of SAP's product range. Really? Personio, for example, reinvented <laughs> HR oh management yeah. to target small yeah. and medium-sized enterprises. Mm -hmm. um, do you see such startups as serious competitors to SAP's dominance in the long run? Yeah, I mean, look, um, 
Cologne is, is another one here in Munich. Uh, we have Signavio. Um, look, I mean, first of all, when it comes to Personio, I have to give them some credit. I mean, every entrepreneur deserves a lot of respect, especially when you are courage enough to build a startup here in Germany, yeah, where you're not having such a huge market like in the United States, where the funding is maybe also not coming so easily as when you're sitting in the Silicon Va Valley, you know, circumvented for many of um, investors. And, and, you know, for Personio, for example, you know, so far, so good. I mean, they are actually, you know, are running, you know, very small companies in, in, in one country so far. We have to run companies uh, across 130 countries, including China, and I can tell you when you have to localize WeChat and you have to understand how Chinese companies recruit, or when you do finance regulation, tax regulations in, you know, in Brazil, it's a nightmare. This is what SAP really differentiates. And this is where I don't feel now a real threat, but I have a lot of respect. And of course, we are watching those companies. I follow Personio. I like the story, what they explain. I, and I also looked a little bit about, hey, they are very, really creative. Can we learn from that? Mm -hmm. So it would be completely ignorant to say we, it doesn't matter and uh, we, we don't look at that. No, of course, we are doing actually a lot of competitive um, market intelligence. I read those reports because it's not like in Schule abschreiben, but you can always get some inspirations. Yeah? And I, you wouldn't imagine how often I talk to Satya around the transformation of Microsoft. And you wouldn't imagine how often we see similarities. So I would be completely stupid to just ignore that and say, I, I know everything better. So even as a CEO and as a large enterprise software company, you need to be always curious. And as Ted Lasso says, not judgmental. It's a good series. <laughs> SAP has also launched or um, supported in launching uh, their own um, venture fund yes. about 20 years back. Yes. Does Sapphire Ventures play an active role in that strategy? Yes. Yes, it was actually a good idea. At some point, we turned a little bit of one corner yeah, because we used it, we used it as a, a finance instrument and our cash flow benefited heavily from that, especially when all of these unicorns really, you know, um, waste in market cap, in market valuation. Uh, the point is, we should have used it a bit better from a strategic point of view. Yeah, so especially in the data and analytics space, I feel SAP could have done a better job to detect some trends earlier. So when I sit together with Nino and Sapphire Ventures, you know, for me, it's rather less important how all of these investments are paying off financially. For me, it's more important about what do all of these companies do and how do they complement SAP's portfolio and what kind of value can I get out of them so that not suddenly, you know, one of our competitors are acquiring one of those assets and I think to myself, oh my God, we missed something. So we use also Sapphire Ventures to be more involved, to get more insights, to take a board seat, and you see with OpenAI, maybe sometimes the board seat helps. And, uh, and, and, and to just also, you know, get more influence. The same is also now true with Alep Alpha, our neighbors there. And uh, you do that to, you know, also have technology-wise, again, more insights and more influence. Munich has established itself as a buzzing startup ecosystem with many students searching a career there. Let's just imagine, hypothetically speaking, you had the unique opportunity to address 1,200 of the most talented students directly. Mm -hmm. How would you convince them or how would you uh, convince them to consider a corporate career? Uh, look, um, <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, but maybe I can use myself as an example, and I'm not sure. I mean, I have seen SAP, I have seen, you know, I was two years in the United States when we acquired Success Factors, and Success Factors was at the point, it's an HR company, so so-called competitor to Personio. Um, you know, I was actually a type of CEO, and I really also then learned back then on what does it mean, you know, to run a company end to end. But at least with SAP and Clemens, you know, who's working now in my communications department, he just joined from 
from, from Siemens. They actually just told me how, how much he feels that we have actually almost no hierarchies, yeah? so that we have also, you know, we removed a lot of hierarchical levels. And, you know, when I want to talk about AI, I want to talk to some data scientists. I don't only want to talk to Thomas Sauer-Essig as much as I value him, but I really want to learn from the experts, and I want to invite customers, I want to invite partners. And, I mean, this is what SAP gives you. Is this not great that you can right away use this technology and see how it works at the customer side? And then you are being able, you know, now I'm 43, here I'm feeling old. When I'm meeting with the CEOs, I'm feeling super young and I'm super grateful uh, to SAP that SAP gave me this chance. And it was not a matter of age. It was not a matter of location. It was not a matter of my social background. It, it was hopefully a matter of performing and being, you know, at the end, a great team player, what really matters inside SAP, and then you see what is going to happen. And now you have a lot of influence. You feel sometimes the pressure, but you also, you know, have a lot of impact. And this is what really is so great about corporate, about large corporates. But I also understand when we sometimes acquire a signal view, a few people leave and say, Christian, this is not my world. I want to start the next gig, and I want to be working small teams with zero bureaucracy, and I just, you know, want to be an entrepreneur again. Yeah, I mean, what to say? Of course, we need more of those people, so no bad feelings. So it has always some pros and cons, and it really depends on, you know, what is for you, you know, the right, you know, working culture. And the, the most important thing what I learned in life is when you walk into the morning into the office, you should have a feeling of, oh, I really like what I'm doing. I have a lot of fun here. And not thinking about, oh my God, not again. Yeah, and so this is, this is really, I mean, this is everything. When you don't have passion for what you are doing, you cannot bring your best yeah, to, the, to the job what you do. It's the same in sports. When you don't love what you are doing, my, my, my son, I cannot help him, he doesn't like soccer. So it will, never, it will never work out, I see it right now. Now I can force him, but that would be the completely wrong thing to do because he doesn't have fun, he's not enjoying it. And there are some similarities also in the daily job. Thank you. We now have about 15 minutes to answer your questions. My colleagues will be going around with microphones. Um, Please, if you have a question, please keep your answer, uh, your question, sorry, your question short and precise, and also stand up while asking the question so we actually know who we are talking to. See a question over there? Put up. Okay. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Um, Microsoft Research recently published something that's called Autogen, which is a framework for agents. Are you planning to build something such as this into your dual thing, which could potentially automate administration, operations, business, sales, legal, and so on? You could replace human beings by swarms of agents using Microsoft Autogen or something else. Yeah, I mean, now it's Q4. We have a lot of deals to transact. I hope a lot yeah, and uh, for the quarter. And you know, you just said, you know, um, you know, a legal and uh, or the commercial deal support. Yeah, we have in such a cloud contract. It's not an easy one to deal with. You have cybersecurity SLAs. You have SLAs on disaster recovery, high availability. These are extremely local, sovereign cloud requirements, and it takes sometimes up to six weeks and a ton of legal people to check those contracts on both sides. 60% of that work will be done by generative AI and our, by our finance and contract administration tool, yeah? because we actually can actually screen for millions of core contracts the this, this similar patterns and can give advice on how to structure these co this contracts best. Or when you're working in controlling or FP&A, we gave the team the task to use our analytics cloud, our predictive planning to not only simulate me financial scenarios to put out the ideal financial guidance for next year, but to also simulate right away the, the workforce planning, the procurement planning, the sales planning, the territory planning, that you're gonna say when I wanna do 40 billion of cloud bookings, 
what does this mean? How many salespeople do I need? You know, where do I need to hire those people to have the, app to the optimal coverage for our 400,000 customers? And it's unbelievable, you know, what kind of results you are getting bad. When you ask all of our FP&A people bottom up, you always get a risk buffer. You know, you always think to myself, when this is true, it's going to be the end. But it's never the end. This is how planning sometimes bottom up works. And so, you know, these tools, to your point, in finance, in legal, they will really make a, a huge difference, you know, both from an automation, but also from an intelligence perspective. Do we have a question on the other side this time? Choose one. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Klein. A um, couple of minutes back, you said that you have a that, that you see a big problem in Germany when it comes to sharing data, especially because we're a federal state. Um, you quoted the example of tax. Um, can you name different policy areas and also maybe a vision how we can overcome? I mean, we can't just change that we are a federal state, but maybe we can, yeah, build on on certain great ideas to, to overcome this, this assistance. Yeah. Thank you very much. You can, by the way, just say Christian. It's totally okay. Uh, um, the, you know, when uh, before the last election, I also said also publicly to increase a little bit pressure. It didn't help, but, you know, I actually was, a lot, uh, was in favor of a digital ministry. Uh, and not only a digital ministry, you know, just to have one, but really some a ministry which actually is super empowered. Yeah, because when you when you look into all the different ministries, um, they are all making their own IT decisions. Yeah, but they all you know gonna serve us as the citizens, and you know as you know all of you know, data and semantical data is matter. So. Why should, you know, you, Alexander, as a citizen, have in the finance ministry a different identity than in the health ministry? It doesn't make sense. It's not the best experience. It doesn't scale. It's not productive. No one really sees you as we 60 view of you being a citizen. So this ministry, you know, for digital would extremely help. And I see it in Switzerland working really well. I see it in the United States, in Australia. And then I will very much like the federalism in some ways, but the federalism, like you know, every state has its own say. It's not not good when it comes to digital. You know, when, for example, my little son is getting practiced in school, and they have the fancy idea to ban Microsoft Teams and use a very old school learning platform, and then it doesn't work. It doesn't help. And when then 18 states feel they need to go different routes. <laughs> It's not only really m much more expensive, but it's also then, you know, not needed, yeah, because actually the kids really should have one learning platform. Or take reskilling for Europe, an initiative we are pushing a lot with UNICEF and others, and I'm actually a member of that. How about we have so many young people who are not having a job? We actually having a huge demand right now for SAP consultants somewhere in the world. And we could teach them, we could reskill them if we would have, you know, a learning platform and actually we could certify them. And then we can actually connect, you know, universities to it. We can connect, you know, our Bundesministerium for Arbeit to that and to really have a, a, a platform on really helping, you know, young people to find a job. We are doing this, but on a very country by country basis. We could do it way better if we would come together on one platform across Europe. And these are some of the examples. And in Germany, what I always tell also our chancellor, I said, hey, it would be good to have this ministry, empower them, and put the IT budget into that. Then they, of course, still have to have clear SLAs, you know, for all the ministries, but have someone who puts a clear framework around that. And that's true for the public sector, but it's also very true for the private sector. Should we take another question from the center? And then maybe if we could afterwards have um, one question from, from above, that would be great. Any hands? Um, hi, thank you. Um, is there one or two books that you will recommend to us? To tools? AI? Uh, uh, no, I mean books like reads. Books, Bücher. Bücher, ah, books, ah. 
Now I'm getting it. Oh, when did I read the last time a book? Um, it's a good. It's a good question. Uh, look, um, you know what I'm more into right now. I actually love to read uh, the Economist. Uh, because I really feel I'm getting a good overview around what is happening in politics, what is happening in economy. Uh, I'm also studying a lot, you know, certain research on knowledge graphs, on other things. So, sorry that I cannot be now a better role model in, you know, you know, reading some of the more social books, but I'm really doing a lot of, I'm reading a lot of research, I'm reading a lot of economic magazines. And I'm also honestly, you know, to do some promo for Microsoft, I'm also um, using LinkedIn because sometimes I really also use that platform to see what the, other, what the other companies are announcing, what they are doing on business AI. And that's what I'm actually typically do. And then every morning I'm getting actually an extract of, you know, all the media reports about SAP. There you have to read a lot. Uh, but it's for me very important to also feel the market sentiment and what is actually happening out there everything around SAP and, you know, no matter if it's in Asia, in, the, in North America or in Europe. Do we have a question in the, in the top row? Uh, but in a way, there's dilemma, yeah? So a book, actually, which I read a long time ago, when you are leading SAP, you know, there you find some, sometimes some similarities. So I can recommend that book, who probably a lot of you already have read it. We do. Nice. <laughs> In a way, that's the dilemma. You know, when you when you look at that, I mean, SAP right now, I, I I have to, but I'm also indeed very confident about SAP's future. But it's actually, you know, when you also look into the German DAX and in certain industries, I'm not sharing now which industry, it's remarkable sometimes, yeah, when you are a big, large enterprise how hard it is to say goodbye to a traditional business model when the margins are great, when you're still growing. And, you know, and, and then, you know, to really have to see it, to see it coming, and then to take the risk and to take the courage and say, hey, despite everything is looking so fancy, we need to radically change our business model. And, um, you know, you wouldn't imagine how also how big the resistance then is, yeah? because when people are doing something very well from, for 30 years, it's, it's hard. The change management is very hard. The investors also don't like it, obviously. So when you always do the, your decisions based on what the share price should do the next quarter, I'm sure the company will go at some point out, out of business. And so this book is something. You know, now SAP is on a very good track, but I give you an example. God knows that. In 2006, we had a subsidiary called SAP Hosting. Hosting, hyperscaler. There was no Azure, there was nothing. And actually, uh, SAP sold this because it had a 15% margin and not a 35% like what we had in the on-premise business. I mean, think about that. Now, I have a lot of respect for Azure and everything what they do around, but the pure infrastructure is now, you don't need to innovate, you know, the, the sky from the, st the stars from the sky. So it's actually a, it's actually a business which we could ha have easily covered. But there was a lot of resistance back then because we needed to change, you know, our financial guidance. You need to change, you know, you see your existing business model is getting disrupted. Yeah, and so, and while today they are all great partners, and it's for, for SAP not a make or break, as we can compl as we complement extremely well, it of course was a missed opportunity. I think we have one last question from the top row. Is the microphone turned working? On? Working. Yeah. Okay, Klaus here. Hi, Christian. Could you um, please stand up so we know? Who okay. We are talking? Sorry. Um, my question is um, when you see the democratic demographic change how is uh, ai helping your company to meet less talents and maybe also how, how is the stream of ref refugees helping in this way like you can hire those talents is that an option yeah i mean it really depends on, yeah, I mean, I can now talk on behalf of SAP, but I also see it with some customers. Look, in, um, in Germany, not only 
you know, our population is getting older and older. We're also missing, we have actually have a huge gap uh, on certain job functions which we desperately need. And so when you talk about refugees, actually, uh, when we actually, when there was the outbreak of the war in the Ukraine, we actually brought a lot of great talents into SAP and we are happy and to have them as they are great talents, well educated on computer science and others and other topics. So, so we need those people. And of course, now with generative AI, you know, what you have to do is you need to, on, on the one hand side, infuse young talents like you, but you also have to put a lot of money on the reskilling of your existing workforce, yeah, because job profiles like for a lawyer or for an FP&A person or for, uh, for sure for an engineer will change a lot. And, and, and so that will, you know, actually is super important. And then last but not least, uh, of course, uh, with the demographic change, it's, it's also very important when I look into other countries and the United States is our biggest market. Of course, there it's also very important to see, you know, where are the universities. Of course, there's the Silicon Valley, but there's also other universities around, a huge ecosystem around. Like when you look more to the south, you know, oil and gas is a big industry. So we also need to drive the change there because we need labs and hubs there because with the energy transition uh, to more renewables, we need people exactly also being expert in that. So you not only need the best coders when you are SAP, you need to also be have the best talents in that industry who actually understand something about renewables. Or when you actually gonna code now with BMW, the mobility services, you need some people who actually understand that business. So for us, it's it's super important, yeah, to have this infusion of young talents, but also invest into reskilling. And here in Germany, I feel it's super important that we also get uh, getting also young talented people from all over the world <laughs> into Germany because there is a huge gap especially when, when I also look into the SAP ecosystem. Thank you for all of your questions. Are you ready for some, for some rapid fire questions? Oh, Which yes. Which means that ideally you keep your answers short. Let's go. What's your favorite social media platform? LinkedIn. When is the last time you sent somebody a meme? Excuse me? A meme, the, the pictures with, with funny so text on it. Yesterday. Yesterday. Um, if you weren't at SAP, where would you be besides speaker series? Microsoft. We asked a few guests about this. If SAP were an animal, which one would it be and why? <laughs> <laughs> Two years ago, I would have said an elephant. Now we are a tiger. What's your, fa what's your favorite brand of skis? Um, I have some slalom and I have some off slope, but my wife hates it. And what's your favorite brand? The off -slope. Like, what's your favorite brand as in as in the company behind the skis? Like For skis? Yeah. Fisher, Atomic. Uh, I have one Völkel and I have um, Stefan. <laughs> he bought me some skis actually. Uh, Atomic, yeah. Atomic. Which specific technology or innovation besides the AI excites you the most? Uh, green ledger, you know, everything what we do around sustainability. Okay, thank you. We've touched on the role of mentors earlier, um, and you also mentioned that we often need to learn certain skills or lessons to advance. Um, could you elaborate on how mentors have shaped or specifically shaped your personal and career development? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, here with Gerd, I actually learned how to always look at our business from a customer perspective. I have actually had Jim Snape, you know, who actually also learned, where I learned how to lead big teams with empathy, but with clear direction. Um, I had um, Lars Dahlgaard, uh, externally he felt more like someone from the United States, but he was from Denmark, and I actually learned a lot from him how to run a software as a service business and really keeping a whole company intact. And so I learned a lot, and everyone had different personalities. So I would say it's very important, yeah, to also 
at the after a certain time to also go out of your comfort zone and also having different mentors because you can learn a lot. Uh, and actually, you know, this broad perspective, this broad profile also helps you, especially when you want to go more into a manager career later on. We started the conversation by reflecting on your last 20 years or the first, your first 20 years at SAP. Now let's look into the future and talk about the next 20. Do you see yourself or can you imagine yourself being the CEO for the next two decades or is there maybe <laughs> another challenge that you want to embrace? Ah, when is the, the contract extension coming up? I guess <laughs> if you want. Um, let's see. Uh, it's not in my hands. I mean, now that we are so well on track on, on our transformation with generative AI, it's of course a very exciting time. So I would love to continue what I do because I love my job. Um, now, will I do that until I retire? I doubt it. Uh, but now I have a lot of fun. And I, I would love to lead this company also, you know, for at least another decade. Thank you. <laughs> well, Chris, thank you for your time and expertise. And thank you for joining thank us. Thank you, Alexander. <laughs> Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight and showing interest in the events we organize. Also, a big thank you to the entire team of the Tom Speaker Series for making this happen. If you would like to know more about the transformational story of Siemens, then join us here next week at the same day, same time, same place, or just scan the QR codes in front of you. Until then... Who is coming from Siemens? Joe Kayser. Ah, I see. Yeah. Joe Kayser is coming, for those who wondered. Great. Until then, a big round of applause for Chris. Thank you. Danke dir.